This is a panel discussion devoted to the state of global real estate, the property, uh, you know, a paucity of decent property in the market and the issues that that brings for your profession. Having listened to David McWilliams this morning, however, I'm rather, I rather think that perhaps if all the old grannies died and the Egypt bankrupt son-in-laws had their way, this would solve the problem. But <laughs> we have to wait for that economic cycle to come good again. But let me introduce you to the members of the panel. Right at the very far end, they're looking resplendent in blue, may I say, <laughs> is Marie O'Neill of Dubai. Say hello, Marie. Hi. Next to Marie, I'm sure a lot of you will know, Teresa Tyrrell from here from Dublin. Hi, Next, um, from Panama, Maria Carolina Neri from LATAM and Panama. With the really gorgeous scarf there that I'm really doing, <laughs> divine scarf, Jennifer Awari from Cape Town. Okay. No, I'm actually from Kenya, but that's funny. <laughs> from Singapore, Lily Heng here. I'm going to be in the middle here. From Singapore, Lily Heng. <laughs> Thank you. From Mumbai, Lala Patel. <laughs> and from New York, Brenda Levis. So it was a, a great pleasure to have you all here. Now, what I'm going to do is this, I'm going to ask everybody very briefly, because there are seven of you, so very briefly, to give us an overview of your situation, what's happening in your, in your area. Uh, there will be similar problems for all of you, and then rather very specific and different problems for each and every one of you. I am then going to encourage everybody, anybody who is here in the body of the Kirk to ask a question, or please to come up here, because we have got all the mics out throughout the building. So if you would like to put a question, or if you have something to say about about your region or some insight or issue that you'd like to ventilate, please come up here and speak from the podium. Right, uh, I think perhaps we'll begin with the home team, shall we? Should we begin with Dublin and tell us what's going on here? Well, I think um, David McWilliams summed it up nicely and I'll, I'll leave after this. The market is monumentally wrecked. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I guess as a DSP here in Dublin, um, when people decide to relocate, the first thing they go is to the internet, to Google, and I think David mentioned this, that they're bombarded with go gossip, propaganda news. It is true, the market is in trouble, but you know, what I did a quick Google just to see what would come up uh, 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 you know, first. Rents continue to increase as market is chronically starved of homes. New rents 13.7%, higher on average as availability hits all-time low, and hundreds queue for hours to view just one rental property in Dublin. So they're thinking of coming, they're saying, will I, won't I, they're encouraged to take an assignment, a job, and we have to figure out how to get them, as a DSP, how to get to them early enough to relieve the fears. It's not just about, we were talking about managing expectations, and yes, we have you know very low property stock and we need to manage the expectations around that, but we also need to get to them early to actually start working with them and just know that there's somebody locally that has their back. When I do an introduction call, I like to do it as soon as that person has agreed to take the assignment as possible. Sometimes you're working with an RMC, not Altair, but I did work for someone else at one stage, and um, you know you could, they could have a, a file for, we weeks on end before they pass it to the DSP, mm -hmm. given lots of time for that fear, anxiety, all that to build. If you give it to the local experts early, I think it helps, you know, enormously. Um, the other thing is, you know, just a, a short story again, it wasn't Altair, it was a different uh, company I was work, working with uh, about managing expectations, it's having the right people who are doing the managing. I was on a call with somebody and um, basically the person who was coming said they wanted a big place with two bedrooms and this and that and the other and it was a 1200 euro budget. Now I wasn't, I was sitting there going this is not going to happen but when am I going to get my moment? Um, the guy or the person who was doing the call turned around and said, and would you like a balcony? <laughs> <laughs> so straight away, I had to go into recovery mode uh, because obviously none of that was going to happen. But the person who was actually controlling, facilitating the call actually hadn't got the knowledge of my local market. Um, so for me, in terms of managing, I think we, we were talking about how we manage, I think everyone's going to talk about the problems of their market, mm. but how we manage expectations. For me, the key thing is getting in early 
and um, also building consistent communication. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just have an intro call, they're not coming for two months, leave them alone, talk to them a week before. We try to actually interact with them regularly, see how they're doing, alleviate the fears, um, and you know, by the time they get here, they're, they're, they're okay. Yeah, this is a point we will come back to, alleviating the fears, or perhaps some, uh, suppressing some of the ex excessive rosy sort of optimism about yeah, what's available. Absolutely. So it's actually getting in quick and getting in sort of hard and explaining to people absolutely. what the situation yeah, is. Yeah. Thanks for that. Now let's go back was over here and asked Mari what's going on in Dubai. Well, hey, you've had you've got stories to tell in Dubai at the yeah, moment. Certainly. Um, well, the property market is booming and for several reasons. Um, we've had a lot of high net worth individuals move to the UAE and Dubai in particular. Um, we had a huge influx of Russians and high net worth Russians last year, um, but a lot of high net worths from all over the world. And the property market, like, for example, January of this year compared to January last year, property sales were 70% higher. There were 6 billion euros worth of sales in the month of January alone. Um, another change and shift is, you know, typically in Dubai and the UAE, expats went for one, two years, they left. That is completely changed. Expats are now staying for 5, 10, 15 years. You know, I'm there 16 years. And expats are now buying properties to live in. Mm. So that, again, has also affected the property market. Um, but look, we're lucky in Dubai because we've got plenty of desert. We can expand. They are building. We don't have the politics of not being able to build, like in <laughs> cities like Dublin, they're having um, issues. So there is plenty of supply coming on. It's the high-end properties, really, where we're struggling at the moment. And overall, properties increased 20% last year, on average 20% this year. But the high-end properties we're seeing, they have doubled, tripled in price. So that's where the demand is at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, but. But if you look at Dubai compared to other cities, London, Singapore, Hong Kong, you still get a lot for your money in Dubai. They are much bigger properties, good facilities. So I think, you know, compared to other markets and listening to the ladies when we spoke earlier in the, the week, I think we're not the worst compared to other cities where, where they can't expand. Properties are smaller and there are more struggles. I mean, different issues. Um, I think you were mentioning in a conversation we had the other day about uh, landlords in Dubai are allowed to say what kind of people, what nationality people mm. the, that they would quite like in their rather glamorous establishments and also demanding a, secu a security deposit. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, so there are, are other no glitches. rules yeah. and regulations yeah. to say, you know, you, ca you can't be selective on who you want in your property. And that is quite challenging for us and us as a company and our relocation consultants as well, um, you know, when they're dealing with the signees. So let's move along because there's so much to cover here. And I want to what I want to do is ventilate all the issues, the similar issues, the, di the different issues, and then perhaps come to a couple of solutions that we might suggest going forward to, to alleviate the situation as much as we possibly can in the business. Uh, Maria Carolina in, in Panama, well, you you're based in Panama, but covering LATAM, what's the situation there? Exactly. And we have a lot because we have several different countries, but we have some countries that deal with the issues with um, the, the monetary changes and that inflation goes really high, so properties go up um, very frequently. In some of the countries like Venezuela, uh, Argentina, we have that issue. Uh, in Panama specifically, we, and a lot of LATAM is not regulated, so real estate is not regulated. You will see one property under many realtors and at different prices. So we try to control that, saying, well, the first one that um, sends the property at the lowest black price will be the one to, to, to show it. Um, also, because we were in a lockdown for in Panama for about six months, construction stopped. So that, in addition to the fact that we have been in a roller coaster. We were in 2018, 2019, very high. Then it went down 2020, 2021, and then up 2022. So a lot of people bought, the, the owners bought when it was high. So it stopped being profitable to rent a property. So a lot of people want to sell. Even though we have a lot of properties to offer, most of them will be to sell, not to rent. So that reduces the amount of properties we have available. Okay, those are your issues. Mm -hmm. um, Jennifer, in, in Cape Town and your your global area, what what, what, are the, what are the issues going on? You're based in Cape Town, but you... I'm not. 
You know, oh, I thought based in Nairobi. Oh, you know, oh, right. I did. I thought I've got the wrong. I've got it's the wrong right. intel. In the continent. There you go. Close enough. <laughs> so, you know, okay. It's seven hours away. Okay. <laughs> anyway, tell me about your area. Right. So I look after the East Africa region, and I would say, you know, the the most the busiest markets we've got at the moment is between Kenya and Ethiopia. And we have similar issues in both places. And I feel terrible that we're just having to highlight all the issues that we've got in the housing estate versus coming up with solutions. But ours is more so on the fluctuation of the local currency, which makes it very difficult for companies to budget for housing because landlords are now demanding payment in hard currency. So everything is being quoted in dollars, yeah. mostly in dollars. Um, and the price in dollars today won't be the price in dollars yeah. even two days from, from, from now. Um, and that in itself is creating a lot of issues. Um, is, there's also the mentality of a lot of um, people moving to Africa that everything is negotiable, mm -hmm. and it isn't. Not when there is lack of property and there's an influx of people coming in, in, into the place. And we also have issues of the um, areas where people can live uh, because of security concerns. So the demarcation of where properties are available and the price and the fluctuation in currency is creating a lot of problems. So not only do you have to do the job you're doing, you have to be a forex expert as well, a foreign exchange uh, sort do. of trader, yeah. Yeah. Yes. understanding the volatility of all these currencies. So that's an added problem for you. So we're getting the problems. We will come to some solutions eventually, <laughs> I'm hoping. Um, Lily, tell me what's going on in Singapore yeah. and in your region. I'm born and bred in Singapore, and I've been in this real estate business for 30 years. I've not seen rent hitting so high. We have, that's probably because we have a lot of uh, high, ultra high net worth mm. individuals coming to Singapore. Rent has gone up as high as 80,000 euro per month. This makes the corporate tenants so difficult to compete with these, these ultra high net worth people. We have a lot of um, family office that has to be set up in Singapore. The other issue that we have, just last month, the police has warned that rental scam is re-emerging. This year, in March, we have 300 tenants got rental scam because they want to be ahead of the curve. They pay rent to secure a viewing of the unit. So low crime doesn't mean no crime. So we have this issue. In last August, we have close to 1,000 tenants who has lost money to these fake landlords and fake landlords' agents. Oh my goodness. Yeah, so we, and of course, currently, we, I, I feel that the tenants are less pressurized because they are so used to the vulnerability of over six months. I think they are doing a little bit better, but I, they, they are still suffering, They're suffering with high rent. They are still competing with these ultra high net worth tenants. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, well, that's not a problem that's going to go away anytime soon. Uh, yeah, like but they choose what they want to hear, these tenants, yeah. because the assignees heard that the rent increase will not be as high as 2022. They dropped the word increase. They think that the rent will not be so as high as 2022. They expect that the rent is going to crash. So as a DSP, we, we need to adjust the expectation again. Okay, thank yeah. you for that. Thank you for those <laughs> insights. Uh, it's not a pretty picture that we're hearing here. Um, <laughs> Lata in Mumbai, I think you've got, you've got some pretty specific issues as well, haven't you? Yes, we do. Um, so I think, uh, well, I, we service multiple locations in India, but I'm going to specifically speak for about Mumbai. Um, Mumbai is like New York, like a peninsula, so we don't have villas and get it, uh, bigger, larger communities. We have apartment blocks that go vertical. So. Land is a constraint, and which is why we have gated communities, but they are apartment blocks, and they're so few, you can actually count them on your fingers. So there might be four or five. So literally, when the pandemic left, there was like a virtual war uh, where everybody wanted to come and stay in a gated community because they felt it was more secure. There were amenities, which other standalone properties did not offer. So the properties, these properties, the prices just went crazy. And uh, not only did they go up, but the availability was limited. So we sort of had bidding wars on properties where, you know, whoever took the first apartment got it. I think it was very similar to what happened in Europe. 
But um, another location, I mean, in India, because of the, you know, being a developing country, there was, uh, even, you know, people wanted to be absolutely sure that they were secure and safe. So we had those challenges to deal with. Also, a lot of uh, individuals moving wanted to do a virtual tours coming before coming into India. So they, that would limit the number of properties they would see on the ground. Now, virtual tours are good in like a developed country where you know what you what you you're getting what you pay for. But in India, what you see and then doing a virtual tour, and you know, I strongly believe that you need to go with your vibe of a property. You can't just take something which you see online. So we had challenges where we did try to sh do a, do some home searches. Home searches. Some were successful. Some, after they arrived, li did not like the property and need to go re reverse the transaction, etc. So those were real-time challenges we had. Things have settled now. And uh, you know things are getting better, but the availability still remains limited. Thanks for that. Sure. Um, and Brenda, well, New York has always been an issue, hasn't it? Oh. It's always been tough getting decent property in New York. But I think you've got multiple contrapuntal issues now that you have to deal with. <laughs> yeah, so with COVID, a lot of people did exit out of New York, you probably heard. But um, as families pushed out to get more space and home office room, uh, when the uh, COVID started to settle down a bit in the city and we got back to a bit of normalcy, then we saw a lot of the young kids coming back into the city or coming into the city who couldn't afford to live in Manhattan before. So with the discounted rates, they took advantage of roommate situations and the opportunity to come in and have that Manhattan experience. So that was all well and good and it was nice to have a, a breath of youth come into the city. But then last year was really tough when uh, the economy was bouncing back and those leases came up for renewal. First of all, they were coming up at 30, 40, and 50% higher than the rent that they were paying. So they would come back to us looking for some help to renegotiate their leases. And in some cases they made progress and in other cases they just had to move back out of the city. So that was one challenge. Um, New York always is interesting specifically because we have broker fees there. So there are uh, luxury doorman buildings that you can go directly to and rent apartments without paying a broker fee. That's but about what, 15% something? It's very, it's, it's a small number. I, I'd say probably 70% of buildings um, are condo and co-op in New York City, which means they're privately owned units and they're typically represented by a real estate agent, and that real estate agent is expecting to get paid by the tenant mostly, most often. So that fee can be up to 15% yeah, that was, of that's the what annual I meant, 15 rent. Of the, yeah, 15% yeah, yeah. of the annual rent. And a lot of times the tenant doesn't realize, okay, I, I don't need you to take me as a broker, I'll just go directly to the building. Um, but if destination services companies uh, either have relationships with preferred brokers or have in-house preferred brokers, often they can offer a discounted rate of, let's say, 13.5% or 12% of the annual rent. So there's some savings there. And you have an advocate in that you have a tenants agent that is looking out for your best interest as opposed to the, the landlord's agent who is looking out for their best interest. And then to add insult to injury in New York, um, in 2019, uh, there were some very good intentions to um, reduce the amount of security deposits that you, a landlord could take to one month's rent, where sometimes in the past we'd see foreign nationals that were being asked to put up six months rent, 12 months rent, for, to guarantee that they were gonna pay out their lease because if they didn't have a US credit history, there's no guarantee that they're gonna not be a flight risk and just take off and repatriate. So when that happened, the landlord said, oh, okay, I can only take one month's rent security deposit. Great, then you go find yourself a guarantor because I'm not gonna take that risk. So what happened is these guarantor companies popped up or some of them were already there, but they made a lot of money after this real estate law. And so in addition to those broker fees, now you also have to, if you don't have any US credit or you don't have somebody who lives in the New York tri-state area who will vouch for you, who earns 80 times your monthly rent, which not a lot of us have friends like that, <laughs> um, then you have to get one of these guarantor companies to step up. And it's kind of like Dog the Bounty Hunter. You're, you're paying a bail bondsman to guarantee your lease. And it's typically one month's rent, and you never see that money again. Wow. 
So what we're seeing is that companies um, are not wanting to pay that expense. So typically it falls on the transferee to cover that. The company may or may not pay a broker fee. Oftentimes they don't pay a broker fee. And now this guarantor fee that's being enforced more and more frequently is another expense that they have to take care of. So it's not, it's not easy. Right, so we have an overview of what's going on in these, e these areas. Uh, as I say, some very similar issues and some very different, very specific issues. Um, as I said to you yesterday, it's a wonder anybody moves anywhere, how, given how difficult it is. But look, at what point of the conversation does anybody get this information? Is it at the end of the food chain that you hear, oh, and on top of this, you'll be paying this 50, and on top of that, you'll be paying this, and on top of that, there will be key money in certain areas. When do people have these conversations about how much things are going to cost? And is there anything that can be done in having those conversations earlier on in the process? Yeah, <clears throat> that's where it's really advantageous to have, have your transferees speak with the destination services agent really as soon as the process starts. If they yeah. start to apply for a visa, they should already be starting to talk to the destination service providers um, because of all these unique challenges. Mm. Um, and oftentimes, I know in particular we have a lot of traffic that comes in from the UK. They keep learning more and more about this guarantor situation, but often they'll tap us and say, can you talk to the client about this? Because it's so specific and there are so many intricacies of it. Uh, so we're very happy to jump on those calls and the sooner you can set expectations with the transferee and get that out of the way and get them used to the idea of this is what's going to happen when you get to the States, then they're going to feel better about it when they get there. They've planned for it, they've digested it, and, and you can get out there and tackle finding them a home. Yeah. Um, it's interesting, I, as an external person to this organization, whenever I talk about relocation, people often conflate it, confuse it with real estate agents. And, and that's half the problem. I'm sure a lot of people coming to you think, well, haven't you got a special property to give me? I mean, aren't you real estate agents? Can't you sort this all out for me? H how do we manage those conversations? Again, it starts at the very beginning. You know, we all have our unique situation, but when you have that early call, you go through everything. You're going through the market, you're going through their life, what they expect. You're doing everything from the beginning. And, you know, I'm not a big fan of checklists, uh, because then people get asked, do you want a balcony when it's clearly not going to happen? <laughs> um, you know, but I am a fan of talking points that, you know, there are talking points for every market. And I'd love if actually all the people up the food chain, including the recruiters, the talent managers, everything had, you know, some information about the markets people are moving into, mm. because we often get them very late on. Mm. And it, it, it's difficult then to, you know, manage an expectation. They're just going to be disappointed. Yeah. But if we can just get them, as you said, Brenda, again, I think we all concur, get them early as, as quickly as we can. And I think on that as well is getting them early and getting the trust from them exactly. that, you know, we are the specialists. We know what we're doing. We don't take commissions. You know, we're yeah. working on your behalf. Mm -hmm. So getting as to them as soon as possible before they speak to their colleagues yeah. that tell them everything they shouldn't be telling them, mm -hmm. yeah. before they go on websites that have false information, just the sooner we can get to them, the better. Yeah. And because it's very hard to come back from a negative mm -hmm. when they've got this uh, imagination. They're, you know, they're going to get a five-bedroom property when realistically they'll get three bedrooms. Mm -hmm. And then straight away you're on a negative foot. So it's just getting there early and really giving them the trust that we know what we're doing and we're specialists in what we're doing. Now, is this a conversation you have to have with the HR back at base camp, that they're painting the rosy pink, oh, guess what, you've been promoted, and you and the grumpy trailing spouse and the three grumpy children are now off, and it's going to be <laughs> terrific. And it's only very late in the day they find out none of this is going to happen. It's actually going to be, you know, much tougher than you imagined, and you're not getting a balcony, and that's the least of what you're not getting, right? I <laughs> so think it's, it's when, a whole education piece. Yeah, yeah, yeah the yeah. corporates need to be educated. Yeah. And, you know, especially now in our markets, they're changing so rapidly yeah. that yeah. we need to speak to the corporates or the RMCs, we need to tell them what the market is, what the current prices are, because you know, the expectations are, com are set completely wrong from day one. And usually, you know, it's a recruitment phase where they're being spoken to and they're maybe told they'll get a five bedroom property when they won't. Mm. So it's just really important that I suppose, yeah, we're educating the corporates, they're speaking to the assignees realistically from day one. Yeah. yeah. But I said, just to add to that, there is, seems to be a, a major disconnect between the headquarters HR and the local HR. Yeah. yeah. And we find in our market, for example, the local HR live in a completely different part of the city. 
Um, and when the expatriates come in, they're like, oh, but my colleague in the office told me I could get something for 50,000 shillings, and you're telling me that I can't find anything for anything less than 400,000. And was sort of like, well, I don't think you want to go and live where your colleague lives. <laughs> so um, it's that disconnect between the HQ, HR, yeah. and the local HR, and making sure that everybody's on the same page. Oh, very interesting, kind of silos within the organizations that it's your problem to sort out as well. That's, that's an interesting one. We need to train a lot the people at every level, the RMC, the corporate people, to understand, take the time to explain to them what are they going to find their assignees when they arrive, because otherwise they're going to paint their rosy picture. Mm -hmm. And that's the I think, and, and another issue, because then we'll, have, we'll get all the grouses out of the way, or all the issues out of the way, and then, and then I want to hear other grouses and other issues. And then I think we must try and at least come up with a, a few suggestions and then figure out the fora in which these conversations could happen, because it's all very well saying this is shocking and nobody's being educated, and if only they knew. I think uh, yesterday when we were discussing these issues, we were saying, and the other thing is people get on the website looking at all these wonderful properties available in wherever, Dubai and Dublin, and one, the website's out of date, and two, the prices are all wrong. And so everybody's getting duff gen or false information. So um, uh, anything else from the panel? Yeah, Sorry. I was just going to add yeah. that. that yeah. you know, what you see, a lot of the clients, or a lot of our clients go online and see the property prices and expect the same property Deal. on the ground. Yeah. And then we're just fighting against them, the system, the HR, and trying to set the right expectations. So yeah, just, just going to add to that. Yeah. 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 So again, it's very difficult to see because I've got the light in my eyes. I, I'll take the podium. Let's just do this. We, we, need, a, we need a roving mic. OK. Um, oh, good. I can see you better from there. Uh, first of all, questions from the floor, or if, if not questions, actually, if anybody would like to add their own experience in their own area, in their own region, to the mix. And then we can try and tease out a few suggestions or solutions for how we can obviate some of these, these glitches in the future. Please, please. Uh, the, the thing is, I don't know how we're going to manage this until we get a microphone. Oh, Dom's got the microphone. Excellent. Hello, I'm Christine Haney out of New York. The one thing that I just wanted to comment, comment on is I totally agree with what everyone's saying and how educating and um, educating on every single level to everyone involved is super important and also involving the DSP right away but there's also a timing that needs to take place so if someone's coming in and they start their search eight months in advance looking at properties or anything that you see is just not going to be there so the timing I think yeah. is extremely important that was it. No, no, that's a, that, that's a key point, isn't it? Like, too soon and it's irrelevant, too late and everybody's grumpy. How do we manage that one? <laughs> yeah. Hi, Sylvia Ehrlich from Intrepid. Is there feedback? No, it's okay. Uh, so I, all I wanted to add in to this is one of the things we have started doing is with our clients, we have been working very hard to get to their recruiters. The recruiters are the ones who promise the, the wine and roses that don't exist. So if they have more of a rea reality check, they, that allows some of the assignees that are being offered positions to make a more educated decision. Because if their salary doesn't match the location of where they're going, we have serious problems. Yes. And they have serious problems. So that's a big dilemma. I mean, we've had, we had somebody who was earning about 80,000 a year, which sounds like a good salary in some places, but in Denver, it just doesn't go very far when you have a family. And if you have that in the New York City area, impossible, completely. So it really depends on where they're going. It depends on what their salary is going to be. Come, the home country that they're coming from, that may seem like an enormous amount of money, but if they don't understand what that will get them in the new location, we have problems. They've, and if they've already signed their contract, they have a serious one as well. So we try to get to the recruiters so that they understand that they have to be realistic when they're presenting their offers. That's the first step. Otherwise, and the rest goes from there. If that foundation isn't there, we're all lost. Key insight. And nothing more expensive professionally 
financially, personally, than a failed relo, probably a failed relationship at the same time. And a... So at the back there, we have another. Oh, sorry. Some eyes in the back of my head. Thanks, Bryony. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Kaushik. I'm representing Human Entrance from Sweden. We have a very challenging housing market over there as well, so I can relate very much to what many of you are talking about. And uh, apart from the very great suggestion that talk to recruiters and, and get them on board as well, not only the HR and global mobility, I think another thing that we as an industry could do is that we should go together as in whichever countries we are in, and, and try to influence the the government and the decision makers to you know build more properties or to regulate rents in a proper way if we want to have skilled workforce to attract them to our countries then the governments and the authorities should also be ready to take part of the responsibility it should not only be the relocation company's responsibility to set expectations and and tackle all the challenges that come along the way but we should get some support and and do it in that manner as well that's another suggestion Thanks for that insight. Does anybody want to speak to that? That's, I mean, I think, Marie, you were saying in, yeah. in, Dubai, in certain capitals, certain cities, it is possible to build new stock. In other capitals, it's impossible to build new stock. And then you're looking at regulation, aren't you? I mean, in, in certain cities, for example, the morass of legislation, which actually hide bounds, you know, sort of, sort of works against the landlord, is stopping landlords putting stuff on the market. But anyway, if anybody from the panel would like to speak to that or influence on government or lobbying, as we call it. Well, well, sadly, in Dubai, we can't lobby. Um, <laughs> yeah, but um, there, you know, there, they are building and there's no political obstacles to building, to building. new properties and more supply coming on the market. Mm. Um, and we do have a regulated market as well. It's basically anything between 5 and 20%, but 20% is the maximum that a landlord can put up a property if someone's living in the property. Mm. So there is regulation there to protect the tenants. It's when they move out, um, you know, they, landlords can say they're renovating the property or selling the property. Then when tenants move out, you know, they're looking for a similar property and it could be 50, 60, 70 times more expensive. That's where the problem is. So there's always a way around that. You say you can't put up the, the, the rent more than 20%, but then you can say, right, well, I'm, I'm renovating it. And then it's, it goes exactly. up any And yeah. then, you know, sometimes it doesn't really happen. They renovate or move in or sell the property. But to bring a case against them, you have to pay a percentage to the land department. So a lot of people just won't bother bringing a case against them. So, you know, the landlord really has the upper hand at the moment, um, unfortunately. Yeah. Other issues? Oh, there's a, a question here on this table here. One quick one here. Oh, there. Sorry. Sorry. Hi. Great discussion. Thank you very much. I'm Stephen Cry, and I'm president and CEO of the Canadian Employee Relocation Council. Um, one of the issues that we're facing, and I think this is a global situation, when we talk about housing, is that we do not have enough skilled trades workers uh, to go around. And um, we've got a lot of people in North America particularly, that are leaving the, the trades and nobody's coming into the trades. And so new builds are not getting built. Um, so that's a, that's a real pressure on the, on, the, on the housing situation. Anybody like to speak to that? Or, nope, oh, just another question. I think there's various questions on this table and here and here. We've clocked you, don't worry, we're getting there. Keeping, Brian's got to get her steps in. Martina Meinhold, Management Mobility Consulting France. I think it's very interesting what you've just um, said because well, we, we uh, work in several locations in France and also in Luxembourg and we see that due to remote work or after COVID, re remote work, there are some locations which have become very popular. Everybody wants to go, for example, in the south of France, and other locations, nobody wants to go. Very few people want to go. For, for example, Luxembourg. Why? Because remote work is very much restricted by law for um, <laughs> different people. So that means in some locations, we have the challenge that there is very, very few property, and in other locations, there is property still very high, but nobody wants to go. So in both cases, what we do now is uh, we recommend to our HR um, professionals to organize orientation tours. Because in locations where a lot of people want to go and where it's 
impossible to find properties, is very important to know the location before they sign their contracts in order to get to know um, the different, well, the different challenges. And in the other locations where it is difficult to attract talent, also very important to show these locations. So orientation tools are more important than ever in our area. If I, if I could yes, just, please do. Yeah, if I could just add to that, I think that's probably one of the best points that you brought up. And I think that we find that we're getting a lot of bundled programs where the orientation comes together with the home finding. And so you're taking them out one day on an orientation and the next day they're going straight into their home finding. Uh, and that's creating a lot of issues as well because they haven't wrapped their head around neighborhoods of where they're going to live and how much these properties actually cost, especially in my part of the world where things are changing so fast and so frequently and where there isn't much to choose from because everyone's been told they're going to go live in Africa and the weather is great and therefore they want to be outdoors, have a big garden, they want to swim in pool, you know, they want everything. But... Um, and a balcony. <laughs> comes with the whole, yeah, the whole land. Um, and, and yeah, um, I, I know the cost saving of trying to bundle programs and have assignees come out on just one trip. But if we're able to separate out the orientations, as you say, way ahead of time, just so that people have an idea, and then they can go back and have these conversations. Mm -hmm. I know it's tough for a lot of companies because they've set their budgets uh, for housing, and so, but the time they're coming out, we're being told this is their housing budget, but there is nothing on the market for that price. And so, you know, how, how do we just... There's probably a point there too, that let's say it's two day service, three day service, whatever. Mm -hmm. If it's been allocated to you, to you, to you, three day service, what I need to do to do what I need for the client is different mm -hmm. to you exactly. and to you. Yeah. So for me, it's actually not so much about orientation because we include it more so as part of our home search. We will do it as we do the home search. I cannot do a tour. I cannot say I'm going to bring somebody out on Tuesday. That never happens unless they're spending five or six thousand euro a month. It is literally, I've got a viewing at 10.30 and it's 9.30 in the morning. No, I'll be outside the door. Please get there. And literally we are reacting. We're trying to forage for properties, but at least no, no notice, no nothing. So I need nearly the flexibility for the client to say, we trust you to use that time. And, and that's what we do. We have to literally, we have a two day home search that could last a month. Yeah. Because it's just done over so many days, but that's not maybe for you or you. Yeah. We're all getting the same um, service order, mm -hmm. you know? Also we do, before, before people arrive, we also try to narrow it down, sending like virtual tours so that they get to know a little bit and they don't just arrive and try to figure out where they want to go. So we establish the distance from the school, we go around, we do send uh, virtual tours of the area so that they can start narrowing down and then we can figure a smaller or shorter version of the, of the house hunting, just the area that they, they like. I mean, the key thing is to make people understand the value add of the time that you're devoting. I mean, as you were saying, you know, some of you yesterday to me, uh, you can sort of sell in a, a well, or people will purchase a two to three day home search package. And you've got three properties, two properties to show them. It doesn't look as if you spent much time, but that's all there is. So you have to you have to actually demonstrate to people the value add that you're giving to them, you know, through such a package. How do you square that circle? Again, it's communication. Mm. Now, I'm lucky we have our MC business, but we also have our direct clients. And it's literally through our bi-weekly calls and telling them what's going on, they mm. understand. We literally mm. keep them up to date what's going on in the market, how we're getting the properties. But just bear in mind, if you have a two-day service in, in Dublin and I only get you three properties, I'm thinking, well, I got you three. That really took, that took me two days. Two days, just and so the you rest. Because I rang every agent yeah. and I know the general area. I know who works there. I'm foraging. So you might not get the viewings, but I am I've doing done the, the work. work. And exactly. we need people up the chain understanding the effort that goes into exactly. securing a good property or, a, or you know, yeah. a viewing. We also post that the compliance of your lease documentation, the lease signing, all that also adds up to the home search yeah. program. Yeah. So yeah. you take all that yeah. into consideration. We send links. We send property links to the clients so that we do an elimination process. We, we tease them so that they understand the property market because by sending them the link, they know the price. 
and then we will ask them, what do you like? And more importantly, what you do not like? And then we go on and off and on off for a few times. On the day of the house hunt, they actually know what to expect. Okay, then so that's a very shortage. good way of managing mm. the expectations. Mm. Yeah, but that involves time before. Yeah, the physical yeah, visit. and they know that we are. It, it forms a relationship, the trust, the truth, the relationship together to to move this program as a union. We are the the realtor, the the consultant, the assignee knows that three of them are moving together to achieve one goal. Yeah, mm. yeah. Team effort. I think as well, Francis, and everyone, we're just listening to everyone here and in the audience as well, like a typical home finding now is, is we're spending a lot more time than we used to, say four or five years ago, or a package, and they're being dragged out over like weeks, months. Mm. So it's managing that, you know, as a company, how can you be efficient and managing the cost of it as well? But it is a lot harder to manage it now yeah. than it was. You can see how easy it is, though, for people who don't know this business inside out, that when people talk about Relo, they think it is a real estate agent who's going to find you some amazing property that's possibly not on the book somewhere. Yeah. So it's a sort of, it's like, it's not really what we do, although we may end up helping you do that. It's not, it's, it's not our only job or it's not our key job in the business. I think also setting expectations that even you might find them the perfect property, but they might not get it because we have uh -huh. bidding wars yeah. mm -hmm. too. Yeah. So they could come in and make a healthy offer and offer a two year lease. And you've got somebody right behind that's offering more than the asking rent. Yeah. And there's no way to ascertain in advance what that other bid is going to be. So you just have to give your best offer and hope. Mm -hmm. But that's really disappointing when they don't get the property and you have to pick them up and dust them off and send them back out again. Oh, better the bad news. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Another thing um, that I think is a little bit different in New York is uh, the fair housing laws that we have. And it's a, up at the absolute opposite of what Marie was talking about before, where the landlords can rent to who they want and not rent to who they don't want to. But uh, in New York, the destination services provider has a unique um, a place in that they can share information with the transferees on, let's say, uh, uh, neighborhood demographics, safety, what the schools are like, and uh, the real estate brokers, and I have a table of friends over here that are New York real estate brokers, understand that they're limited in what they can say because of our fair housing laws in the United States and specifically even more so in New York City. Oh. So we add a lot of value as destination service providers to be able to answer all those questions. questions. Yeah. Thanks for that, Brenda. Sure. Yeah, that's fabulous. Um, questions over there. Hi, Audrey Adams from All Points, Toronto, Canada. Uh, we avoided for years uh, helping people with shared accommodation, um, even though that you know, as the market uh, got tighter and tighter and tighter in the major cities in Canada, uh, we eventually had to give in and start uh, working with people to look for shared accommodation. Um, we avoided it because we were concerned about the liability. We avoided it because we were concerned about roommates from hell. Um, and eventually what we did with some legal help is we developed a waiver and guidance about the issues that because of course, when you share accommodation, uh, if one person wants to break the lease, now you've got, a, you've got a problem of who's going to be left holding the bag, how do they handle that? And there's really nothing we can do for them other than say, you can live in downtown Toronto if you do this, but understand what the downside is, and here's a waiver you're going to sign, by the way, because we won't be able to help you if you get into trouble with your roommate. I don't think you have any experience of it. Just a completely I, different well, ball game, isn't it? We do Interesting. a lot of sharing and altair in Dublin. Not all our clients. I think uh, David McWilliams thinks everybody is a senior executive. He made a comment this morning. We we deal with people who earn thirty thousand euro a year who are coming in here, uh, anything up, upwards. But we have a large community of people for one particular company. It's a direct client. A lot of sharers, and they have an eight hundred euro budget. So even doubling them up, putting them together, two people, sixteen hundred euro is not easy all of that. Uh, but we have to manage it because mm. that's our job. Um, so we introduce them early. We try, ra rather than trying to find them um, 
a, a room in an existing lease where they're going into people they don't know or whatever. Again, if we know who's coming early, we introduce them early. So all our uh, home search consultants have a WhatsApp group. They'll say, I have Jenny arriving whenever, she's from wherever, anyone got a match? And we try actually to introduce them. Again, it's all GDPR compliant. Can we share your number? Do all that. But we make introductions. We get them on video calls. This was big during COVID, and now it's carried forward. But we try to get them to know each other a little in advance. And every two weeks, again, I talked, this was a direct client. We have a clinic with all the people coming in with that client. Uh, 12 o'clock every second Tuesday. So they have a, a good few people coming. I do a clinic on exactly that, how you manage a lease how one person will take the utilities, what that means, how all of that works, and how if somebody leaves, how you have to replace them. We go through everything before they actually um, go looking and encourage them, go get coffee, do whatever, try and marry them together that are arriving around the same time. And we have had leases that have fallen apart. Yes, we have. We've had people who got together and realised they hate each, <laughs> hate each other. But having said that, we figure them out, and yeah. the majority of them get on with it. Yeah. But we do work with a lot of sharers, and we have to deal with people who are earning 30, 40,000 euros a year and help them as well. Well, that's a fantastic story. I mean, congratulations on that. Uh, and if you're ever bored with Relo, you could start a dating agency. <laughs> we, we, we talk about that all the time. Yeah. I'm waiting for the first uh, altar of sharing baby to come Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Further questions or comments from the floor? We're also seeing uh, micro apartments popping oh. up in New York City. So you could cook your dinner, take a bath, and uh, watch television all at the same time in your apartment that's <laughs> ab about the size of a queen size bed. But, um, <laughs> wow. but people, in order to have the New York City Manhattan experience, people are willing to pay, let's say, $1,200 a month for a unit like that, or even $1,500 a month for a unit like that, but they can be in the city. So yeah. we're wow. getting resourceful. Yeah, yeah. yes, <laughs> thinking different things. Yes, I saw you here. You've been very patient. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my name is Cynthia. I work in Relocation AS from Norway. Um, so we've talked about that having um, pre pre-orientation and area orientation. Look and see trips are really important. But also something that's been uh, that's really important that only a very small um, percentage of our clients actually do are psychological evaluations of the assignees and their families before the move. Uh, and that's really useful as well because that's when they ask us to speak to them as well after they've had their psychological evaluation to see if this move you know, would work for them. So I don't know how common this is. Never had Great idea. So it would be like a, a probably a life coach or a mentor that would speak to them, speak to the family, especially the spouse, and to to find out what kind of personality types they have, uh, what what type of personality they have, what how open are they to changes, uh, how adaptable are they. So that has been really useful, and it's. It's not very common, and I don't know why it's not common. No. I mean, that's, that's a fascinating idea. How many, how many, how many relos does that stop? Because um, yeah. you know, I mean, it's it's interesting. Uh, I mean, classically, one person gets a job, and the, everybody else has to follow. And quite a lot of people, a bit recalcitrant, or it was always called the trailing spouse, which pregnant with I don't want to go overtones. Um, have you, any of you any experience of that sort of thing? Nope. No. 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 No, because no, the an evaluation takes maybe two hours. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and so it doesn't cost very much either. No, I, I would imagine, yeah, you can do it quite economically. The issue I'm really interested in is how many relos it stops. It mm. stops happening, you know. But no, we've decided that you clearly don't want to go, so why bother? I think there's already enough obstacles that we've been discussing. <laughs> Further questions and insights from the floor? Different regions who want to say something? Is it the corporate who pays for this? For this, um, uh, yeah. Who who pays for this? Who, the, the employer. The, the employer to make sure that it's not going to be a failed reload, I right. guess, which is a good plan. So much else could come out of that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Hi, it's Sylvia again uh, from Intrepid. So, th the the psychological evaluations is something that has been discussed for a long time. I think it depends on the country and the, the, the comfort zone that a corporation would have in terms of having that intrusion into the family. Many times they're very, very super careful 
about not getting that closely involved to the family. Mm. And that becomes the issue, which is why you don't see a lot of it and haven't seen a lot of it in the industry. Everyone, I see a lot of nodding heads, right? So that's, that could be a bit of a problem. We're very fortunate in our company because my background is in psychology, so the needs assessment that we do with the family basically covers a lot of that in the way that they answer the responses, and that allows us to have the conversation with them. But it is not a psychological evaluation. And again, because many of our clients would be very fearful of having that personal involvement and, and the any kind of issues that happen. So for example, now with GDPR and all of the other things, if we learn that they have a special need, whether it's for a spouse or a child or whatever, we have to get their permission before we can even share that. The client doesn't want to know unless we have that permission. So we have to all be very cautious about the individual privacy situations and that prevents, it's life coaching and pre, trip, pre-move decision-making, it's critical, but they're all afraid of it. Fascinating, slightly, slightly off piece from the, from the topic we're discussing, but nonetheless, just another glitch in the system, another, another issue that has to be borne in mind. Well, look, we have about five or six minutes. Uh, I don't want to put any of you on the spot, but we've had this discussion and it's, as I say, I, we didn't want it to be a whinge fest. There are problems, you've recognized some, some common denominators, some very different issues, like you, for example, there isn't a problem of a, build, a new build, but you, for example, there's a problem of, my God, you're dealing with all these ultra high nets and who can afford to spend eight grand a month on, a, on an apartment. So we've all got different issues, but it would be helpful, I think, if we could think, apart from communication as soon as possible, and yet not so soon that it becomes irrelevant, but what do you think perhaps some solutions to the issue, to the issues are, or some ways of ameliorating uh, the situation? Because if there's a shortage of housing, there's a shortage of housing. Um, right, let's kick off, let's go back to the, the home team and see what you say here, Teresa. Putting you on the spot. Yeah. I thought I did really well at the beginning. You did, you did, but we're wrapping it up now. You see how, you see if you're a strong finisher. <laughs> Um, one thing, I, it's related, okay, so it's not exactly um, managing the expectations, but I did want to sort of talk about was um, the, the whole area of measurement of our service. So in Altair, it's all about, you know, the experience, the, the journey from yeah. A to Z. And again, I don't know if he's here or anywhere, Relocation Online has been phenomenal. I feel it's a life-changing platform. I use it. I used it as a home search consultant when I was looking for properties. And obviously now I'm, I'm in, in, in the office. Uh, I just think it's, it is fantastic. And from an experience perspective for the clients, um, we introduced them to this platform on that very first intro call. It has every bit of information you need to know about living in Ireland. It's where we share the properties, we share what properties they can achieve and get. Not now, but when the time mm -hmm. comes for searching. We also have a measurement in there, so we have what we call X checks, experience checks. So after the intro call, we ask them how did we do. After the first viewing, we ask them how did we do. After the move-in date, we ask them how did they do. So we're constantly measuring the delivery of the service. So if we get it right at the beginning and you know manage the expectations of where they're coming, what they're going to it doesn't mean it's going to be a dump they're living in by the way. It just means that you know it might take longer. It means that they won't have the the tour day of eight properties that just trust us we will get you a nice home. And um, but once we manage that from the beginning and then we measure our service delivery and, and, and we can jump in. If we, if we get a bad score after the first viewing, I'm alerted, I know there's an issue when we can jump in and recover the situation. So that's where I finish off. No, I that's very no, that's online. a very positive. I that's told Ronald positive. I would uh, give him a shout out, no, no, it's fantastic. <laughs> no, that's a very, very positive, very positive and a really very good, very good insight. Would you like anything to end on? Would you like a, a yeah, final party and shot at it? Francis, look, as we said here, every market is unique. Um, we can't change the market, we can't change the problems that they are. So the best we can do is basically share as much information as we can with our assignees, with our corporates, as early as we can, keep reinforcing that, you know, you speak to them, you follow up with your communication so that it's as clear as possible. And I think that's the best we can, can do, do and our consultants can do. Maria Carolina. I think um, there is an emphasized value on the DSP because we, we are not real estate agents, yeah. we are not corporate, but we are there and we know the market and we are well educated and can assist them with the process and can educate them 
but we need to differentiate. We're not gonna find you 20 properties. We're gonna find you what you like, quality versus quantity. We'll help you through the signing process, um, utility connections, everything. So there is a good value knowing that, especially in Latin America where it's not regulated, we know how to maneuver and get you to the right people, the honest people. And then, Jennifer, apart from trading, tra training everybody to be a, a Forex expert, how, how are you going to manage the situation? Yeah, um, you know, I'm probably going to sound like, you know, like everybody else and, and like a broken record, but the truth of the matter is it's just us trying to, making sure that people try and trust us a bit more to manage the process, but also to trust when we tell them what the reality on the ground is. Um, and that, yes, in some, we, we've got one leg up on the basis that they are, because, again, when it comes to property commissions that agents get, um, if landlords have access to us directly, then we're able to rent out the properties and ask for that commission to be put in as a discount instead, um, which gives us a bit of a leg up. Um, it's not many. We don't, also don't want to piss off the, um, the estate agents, uh, because that's, that's, we still need them and yep. we still have to work with them. Um, but I, I think, yeah, I, I, I keep saying managing expectations, especially because Africa comes with a lot of challenges, um, because in some cases, you're not just renting a house. There's so many other things that come yes. with it. Uh, you have to think about security. You have to think about backup power. Yes. Uh, you have to think about water storage because sometimes water runs out. I mean, there's just a lot. A lot of other there's stuff. There's a lot going on. A lot on. of other stuff. Yeah. Thanks for that. Lily. Yeah, what have been said has to be said has been said. I just wish that there is a more balanced social dynamic. We want to have a balanced economy, not too tough for the landlord, not too tough for the tenant. So what I usually let the tenant know is that there are three sides of a story. His view, her view, and the truth. <laughs> the landlord is suffering. There are high mortgage rate. Yeah. They enter at the wrong. Uh, they are. Uh, they came into the high uh, at high level. Their property tax has increased. The cost of holding the property is higher. Tenant pays more. Who win? Actually, the lenders. You 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 think you are losing out? The landlord is also losing out. Mm. It's those bankers again, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. the banks, <laughs> the banks <laughs> makes all the money. <laughs> um, your final thoughts, Lata? Um, yeah, pretty much repetitive of what everybody <laughs> said here, but uh, I agree with Marie. You, know, you have to keep repeating yourself as much as you can and set the expectations as early as possible. So what we've done as a team is uh, we, uh, during the introduction call when we introduced the program to the customer, we've got a five-point agenda where we've emphasized these points about setting expectations on the property along with supporting it with pictures so they know what they can get for their budget and uh, this way they're educated before they come in. And then again, through the process, continue to educate them on what uh, the availability would be for their budgets. Yeah. And finally, the final word to you. I love the innovative, I, I love the innovations <laughs> that you are sort of coming up with these like little micro apartments, sort of, uh, you want to live in Manhattan, well, you're living in a box, but if you That's want it. the Manhattan experience, <laughs> some people are cool with that. I mean, it's, it's thinking differently. Mm -hmm. It's thinking inside the box, really, isn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> putting everything inside the putting box. Putting everything inside the box. <laughs> so your final words to draw this to an end. Yeah, I think um, it, it's great if we can suggest neighborhoods, first of all, where people might be able to find housing, P pushing them out further and further and letting them know that that's not a punishment, but mm -hmm. it's actually how the locals are managing mm -hmm. these high rents. Well, we're, we're living in different neighborhoods. We're not all in the West Village. We, mm -hmm. we unfortunately can't afford to do that. Um, and then also I would t suggest if you have the opportunity to get either your corporate clients out or your RMCs out on mock tours, it's a wonderful tool. You mm -hmm. get closer to your clients, you understand their culture better, and they get to see firsthand what this budget will get their employees. So they have a more realistic perception of the budgets that they're offering to their transferees. But uh, I, think, I think that's uh, really helpful. And if you can't get them out, then offer a webinar, offer a virtual tours and, and give them the information that they need. 
Thank you very much. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, communicate, communicate, communicate as high up and as early up the chain as possible. I think that's the, the, key, the key response to this. So, a round of applause, please, for every one of our panel members, and thank you for giving me your time today.